We've been hearing a lot lately about smart cities and all the cool technologies that are on their way to us now. I work with a lot of those technologies. I'm a chief information officer. I work for a city, and I'm a technologist. I also happen to have asthma, which gives me some trouble breathing from time to time. And I have a daughter with a life-threatening peanut allergy. It's nothing to live in fear about. It's just information. We use information to live our lives. And we believe that in a smart city, the data that we have can help us improve our lives. When you think about some of the cool technologies we have coming our way, you think about things like artificial intelligence. And when you hear about AI, you might think about the Terminator coming to get us. When I think about AI, I think about things like machine learning, which is not exactly the same thing, but it's, it's related. And we've taken machine learning and used several years of revenue data to project the future projections on our revenue for the city. And that's a far cry from the Terminator coming to get us. You also might be thinking about things like autonomous vehicles, and you might get excited about that. I know I do, and one reason is that we now know that distracted driving has surpassed driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs as a leading cause of vehicular-related deaths. And we haven't gotten rid of driving under the influence. We've just added something else that's even worse than that. It's going to take us a long time before we get to true autonomous vehicles. And it's going to be little by little, step by step. And for example, the first time you saw driver's side blind spot warning, little light going off, you might have said, oh, that's cool. It's just a little piece of information. Helps keep me safe, makes me a better driver. And the first time you saw maybe a camera in the back of the car, that when you put the car in reverse, you can see behind you, you're not going to hit anything, you're not going to hit anybody. And you said to yourself, oh, that's cool. It's another piece of information. It's just adding to my being a little bit more safe. A more realistic uh, example is parallel parking. This is something where you push a button and it does something that you might have had some difficulty with. Very few of us are really, really good at parallel parking. And that's how it's all going to work. All of these technologies and things we're talking about have to do with the, the big parts of living in a city, our transportation, our food, our health. And we wonder about our smart city technologies. Are they going to help us route my journey to where I'm going more quickly and more safely? For example, I might want to take a Coda bus, a Coda C-Max bus, and use a scooter on one part of my journey. On another part of my journey, I might want to use a park and ride and uh, a shared lift ride. And I want the technology to know where I'm going and why I'm going there and when I need to be there. I want my restaurant to know that I'm allergic to peanuts. I want to know what restaurants have peanut-free options on their menu. If I am in a wheelchair, I want to know what side of the building has a ramp on it, and I want my directions to lead me there and not stairs. We now have air quality advisories that tell everybody about our air quality alerts. In a smart city, I want to receive a personal alert that talks to me about the air quality based on my needs and my particular condition. All of these things are possible because of data and analytics. A smart city is all about data and analytics. And we have all sorts of things that we're measuring in data that we have right now. We can tell for any particular road segment what the average speed of people driving on it are. So you can look at a road segment that's supposed to be 35 miles an hour, and people are generally going about 40 miles an hour. Sometimes they're going 42, sometimes they're going 38, but we can measure it. We can actually see it. We have the tools to be able to measure the water quality in the stream behind your apartment building. And we know how many auto accidents have resulted in deaths this year. We know how many of them related to distracted driving and how many of them related to driving under the influence. We know the age of the drivers. And unfortunately, this is not the number. It's much higher than this. And there's some things that we still don't know, 
but we have many of the tools and measurements to measure it. A city is both personal and public, and we can measure and analyze all of us, such as the example of how we're driving on a particular road segment, and one of us, such as my map application, that I tell exactly where I'm going and it knows exactly how to get me there. And our technology can maximize my personal benefit, which is my fastest, safest route. And it can maximize the public benefit, which is my route should not cause a traffic jam for everybody else. But there's some things that we fear, some things that we're concerned about, and that's okay. To me, it makes me feel like when I was transitioning from having training wheels to not having training wheels on a bike. I knew I wanted to get rid of the training wheels. I knew I wanted to go forward. I wanted to be like the big kids. I kind of knew that I had to do it. But what I was worried about was not just change, but fast change. You know, could I slow this down a little bit? Ultimately, I couldn't. It was time. I needed to make that transition. And I was nervous about it. And that's OK. It's appropriate for us to be nervous and concerned about our data and our privacy. Uh, our people can take advantage of us. Hackers can use our information against us. And we should protect our privacy. It's important. And incidentally, we all know that this is a hacker because he's wearing a hacker's uniform, right? <laughs> and I grow concerned that we always know this is sinister. There's a hoodie, so we know something sinister is going on. <laughs> He's working in a dark room, and uh, I kind of feel like maybe hackers should work in a more well-lit area, <laughs> maybe drink some water, feel a little bit more comfortable with their privacy. They take their hood down, and I'm starting to think that maybe hackers should organize, you know, and get better working conditions for themselves. <laughs> so, but what I'm really excited about is not all this cool technology, but this less sexy topic of data and analytics. So the training wheels are off now. There's nothing but the horizon in front of us. We're with the big kids now. We can ride our bike all day long, and we can really enjoy this ride. And that's the journey I want you to come along with me on. So I love this picture. You see pictures like this, and designers use pictures like this to teach about what they call least resistance design or desired path. And what the story that's basically being told here is that the dirt path is what people actually want. The cement path is what we actually gave them. And how this works is that dirt path is sort of like what our city is. We've already built our city on this cement path with a nice park bench, and we designed it the way people said that's what they wanted. But the dirt path is what we actually did, and it can be measured with data, and we can use that data as we build our smart city on top of where our city was. That's what we actually want to do. So all of us and our desires can be measured personally. We know what each and every one of us actually wants and what we say we want. For example, do we want more roads or do we want walkability? Are we more interested in sustainability versus access to lower prices? And for example, do you want better wireless broadband access in your neighborhood? Well, of course you do. I'm sure you've said you do. But do you want an 85-foot cell tower also in your neighborhood? Not so sure. So what do we listen to? What you say you want or what your behavior tells us in the data? That's why we need to do the analytics. All of this puts me in the mind of being in a public square, a place where in the past you would have thought of where you come in, you interact with your neighbors, you receive information, and you make your voice heard. And in this picture, we have protests in the 60s being compared to protests in more modern times. One of the things that I notice in the modern times is a lot of people in the crowd have a device with them. And at least one person appears to have a latte, which lets me know that it's probably more comfortable protesting now than it may have been in the 60s. Uh, but what's interesting is the concept of the public square where your voice can be heard. And I think that your device may be your access to the public square. You know, the only time where our public voice is heard or expressed is when we vote. 
and we don't actually express our interests. We select a person to represent our interests. In a smart city, if we take the training wheels off and we share some information about ourselves, if we agree to be both an individual and as part of a whole using data and analytics, then in a smart city, our data can be our voice. Thank you.